We've just a week to go now before we're live on stage with the new show, Cocaine Cowboys. Final tickets on sale for Limerick, Cork and Dublin from mcd.ie, our venues. So for the first time in court, we've been given a kind of in evidence, a sort of proper structural look at the Kinahan organisation and how it operates. Now, we were given something in around 2010 during Operation Shovel in um, Spain. And I've no doubt that family tree has completely changed yeah. since then. Some of the names have fallen off the radar completely, including John Cunningham, yeah. who was at that point right up there beside two, yeah. beside uh, Christy Kinahan Sr., who just went into darkness. Yeah, never heard, never really heard of again yeah. um, following Operation Shovel. I mean, I was told a few times, oh, he was up in Alicante. I was told he was in Barcelona, but I never got further than that. I never actually got an address or yeah, yeah. an idea of how he's living, what he's doing. He was a quite a slippery character. Of course, Christy Kinahan and himself met in jail when he was serving a lengthy sentence for the kidnap of Jennifer Guinness. And he actually was sent down to Shelton Abbey to complete his sentence in 1996. He walked out the, the gate on day release yeah. and never came back, went no. over to the Netherlands where he was caught around 2000 with a load of Kinahan drugs and he was jailed there. And of course, this is evidence that's been given during the non-jury trial of Michael Crotty, who has pleaded not guilty. What's he pleaded exactly not guilty to his role in the murder of... Uh, Noel Duke. Uh, Noel Duke. But this is a facil- facilitation charge. Is exactly. It? It's not yeah, actual it's, murder. No, he's not. He's not suspected of murder. He's suspected of of uh, uh, involvement. Yeah. Yeah. In the role of it. This guy basically bought. The state says. Yeah. Bought a mobile phone top up for Sean McGovern, and um, you know, funny enough, what we're hearing is that from the state that there is quite significant evidence against Mr. Crotty. It's an unusual one, perhaps, for somebody to plead not guilty to, because obviously if it comes to a conclusion, if the court does conclude that he's guilty, it'll be taken into account that there has been a trial, etc., etc., and it goes against him when it comes to sentencing. But sometimes I think, and not um, accusing Mr. Crotty of this, sometimes gangland trials, you know, go ahead, maybe because they could be directed from those who could be coming after in trial. I think certainly we'd be happy to suggest that Liam Brannigan, um, who pleaded not guilty to uh, his role in the plot to kill Gary Hanley. Uh, Gary Hanley, maybe did so in order for s- somebody in the upper echelons of the Kinahan organisation to find out what evidence that the state had, because so much stuff comes out, of course, during a trial, the yeah. kind of evidence that... Uh, may be facing. Yeah, but I'm, I think like this, the trial of, of Mr. Crotty is interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, probably the, the first reason is you hear the guards giving a very detailed breakdown of what they believe the Kinahan cartel structure is. Um, now, this that breakdown and that evidence is given under the Criminal Justice Act 2006 and that allows um, a, a, a senior guard to give uh, opinion-based evidence. Is that how it's described? But yeah. basically to say that they know, due to their experience, they have knowledge of these structures. It was first obviously a feature in, in Republican trials to do with the IRA, where people, where guards will go into the, the special criminal court and detail the organisation behind uh, alleged criminal acts. So Dave Gallagher, who also gave evidence during the Regency trial about the existence of the Hutch Organised Crime Group, has given a really detailed breakdown of the Kinnahan cartel organisation. He's a superintendent in the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau. Yeah. He has previously had to detail his career yeah. in the Gardaí and how long he's been working around organised crime. So he's given a, a breakdown of the structure and also then you get a sense of of um, some of the, the the digital interceptions that are going on because that is part of, of, of the evidence that they have given. So if if senior members of the Kinnan cartel, if Daniel or somebody, Daniel Kinnan, for example, was to come back, um, they're unlikely to find, you know, Daniel's fingerprints on a gun. So some of this evidence is going to be similar. And Dave, uh, Superintendent Dave Gallagher is giving this evidence um, as part 
to to describe Sean McGovern's role in, mm. in the organisation. McGovern, of course, is there's a warrant out for his arrest since April of 2022. Yeah. Um, that arrest warrant was publicised on the day of the sanctions against the Kinahan organisation. Sean McGovern himself was sanctioned as a senior lieutenant and was described as Daniel Kinahan's closest ally, basically, yep. at that point. McGovern has been in Dubai since the murder, It just in the very quick aftermath of the murder of Noel Duckegg Kerwin, which was in December of 2016. He went to Dubai and has never returned back to Ireland since. Yeah, but again, we hear him probably, I think, named for one of the first times in an Irish court and Superintendent Gallagher, he's, he's been uh, questioned and he agreed that Sean McGovern is connected to the leadership of the organisation, the Guinness Cartel, and added, he quoted, he is a significant figure within that organisation in a leadership role and is currently based in Dubai. Mm. And he describes then, he, he, earlier on, he had described in detail kind of the overall structure of it. Um, he said the core function of the Guinness Group is driven by monetary gain with drug trafficking as the primary source of income. He describes how they operate at an international level, but also at a street level, which is what we've always said, mm. um, even at the, the height of their powers as an international drug cartel. They were still concerned about, you know, who was selling drugs on street corners. I mean, and in particular no flat complexes. In yeah, Berlin, yeah. You know, yeah. they had very key men controlling. They must have been like, you know, particularly lucrative areas yeah. that they were so concerned over them. And a bit of Daniel Kinnan's maybe control freakery it could be a factor as well. But the legal term? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see now if it comes to the special criminal court. But they said they, the Kinnan gang enforced their control by violence, firearms and murder. Um, and they also engage in money laundering. So that's a significant part of it. Like he, when Dave Gallagher gave evidence in, during the Regency, he described the, the structure of the Hutch gang, which was described sort of as loose and, you know, familial based. And sometimes people work with each other. Sometimes they work separately. But you patriarchal see, leadership, patriarchal leadership, yeah, exactly. So you see a different a different structure is given for the Kinnahans. He describes the organization as complex and well organized. And he says that it's it's definitely hierarchical in nature. And he said some of the knowledge comes from this is probably the first time we've heard this in relation to the to the Kinnahans. He said some of his knowledge comes from phone calls, audio recordings, the seizure of mobile phones and other electronic devices, and messages exchanged on encrypted platforms which were accessed in recent years by Europol. That's my Encro chat. That's, that's your Encro chat, exactly. At long last, we're finding it somewhat useful. Yes. And but I mean, this is obviously, you know, well, not we, well, still, we, yeah, well, wasn't used live. I mean, it's all still there. It's obviously being dusted down out of the drawers and crime and uh, security and handed out to the people who actually need it. Just while you're on that, I think it's important for people to know why Superintendent Dave Gallagher can give this kind of evidence in a court and what sort of qualifications he has for that. He said he's been personally involved in prosecuting those in leadership roles within the organisation and members or associates are others who enhanced the criminal activities of the organisation. So he has been there kind of for some of the major investigations into the Kinahan organisation and their, their, their subgroups. He said he'd led at least eight investigations which resulted in interventions where there was an imminent threat to the lives of persons who were attacked using firearms by members of the Kinahan organisation. Um, so that they would have been the high profile, you know, hit attempts that were... Yeah, no, when Patsy Hutch Patsy was targeted. Hutch and Gary Hanley and... and Michael Gately. Michael Gately and others. So, I mean, you're talking about when they brought in international hitman Imre Arrakis, when they used... Um, subcells, murder hit teams from within their own organisation and beyond. One of those hit teams was kind of a Finglas based gang. Uh, other hit teams were North Inner City based. Some of them were INLA linked. Um, so very interesting, I suppose, if you're involved in those investigations, the proper detailed look you have into yep. how they how they operate. He said he's also been involved in investigations into drug trafficking, firearms offences, and as a result, he said, 
33 people had been arrested in situations which he was involved in personally. Yeah. So. And he describes the cartel, he, he says it's hierarchical in nature with a command structure. But he says, which we've always described, around its core activities, it has a structure of subcells with various responsibilities. And he said within those subcells, there's there's a further hierarchy but not everybody involved is a member of the organization. So we see like the, the cell structure was a thing that's that's borrowed from probably from the IRA, mm. uh, you know, and, and copied worldwide, really, where you have cells who only know the operation of their cell. They members of that cell organization wouldn't know what the higher ups are doing. So they, they if they are caught, that's what they have evidence of. That's what they have. They if they be to become state witnesses, that's what they know about. They don't know what the other cells are they doing. They don't know what the other cells are doing. And there's only one person within that cell that might deal with somebody further up. Mm. And not all of these people, as it says, some people take on roles for monetary gain, because, but some of it do it for fina- family links. So they're hired freelance. Basically. So they're hired freelance. And we saw that in particular, some of the operate, the, the, the hit attempt on Patsy Hutch, where you had people uh, from Fingless who were ultimately convicted in relation to that, but they probably never would have met Daniel Kinnan or anybody senior mm. within that organization. So they were solely hired and they had knowledge of they had phone traffic from within that that structure. But there are other people that are more trusted and say Liam Brannigan would be somebody that that would have been within the structure, but still hired to op, sort of operate this this subcell or being in charge of operating that subcell. An evidence heard during his trial showed that he was directly speaking to Daniel Kinnahan on the phone. So he was the go-to guy within that subcell. Of course, there was some slagging between the two of them about women and Daniel Kinnahan. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. Wanted it was a bit strange when his wife, Kiva Robinson, was pregnant. Um, the interesting, though, about that subcells and how they operate, because you can bring that all the way back to Spain to the beginnings, to the late 90s, to the early 2000s, when the Kinnahans start to place themselves down on that Costa del Sol and they're operating cells then. They're um, initially transporting cannabis from Morocco. They've made connections with some big Moroccan suppliers and they have, they're landing it on the beaches and they have various subcells who have their own transport systems um, they're basically collecting the cannabis in cars which have been modified. The back seats have been torn out of them. They're, la- they're sh- you know, bailing the, the cannabis in at night and they're driving those cars to a warehouse where the cannabis is then put into lorries yep. and sent on up through Spain. That was one classic route they used back then. They were making a lot of money on that, actually, I have to say. Um, and kind of got them properly going. But they all were ordered at that point. They had to change their first name. Yeah. So you could be Donald Nile, actually. Yeah, yeah, okay, great, great. You had to change your first name and it was sometimes your middle name. Yeah. But you could only refer to one another by that name. It was just kind of a little thing to confuse, um, you know, to confuse anybody that might have been listening in or whatever. Um, And they hung around together. The cell structures just hung around with one another and they didn't really know who the hell else was working, you know? Yeah. So that's something, and, and I think you're right, I'd say... That absolutely came from Christy Kinahan Sr. was probably studying yeah. the, you know, yeah, I mean, it was, structure of the IRA and the likes and terrorist organizations. But I mean, it was, it was a deliberate part of the IRA's history that as they started to get, um, you know, the British government started to place informers in their midst or turn mm. people that they realized this was the way to protect the broader organisation. Um, and you see in this description as well that you have people that are solely concerned with money um, or people that are solely concerned with the, the movement of drugs. We've had people convicted in, in Dublin who are described as warehouse managers or distribution guys. They wouldn't have knowledge of the movement of money, for example. But obviously, within sm- smaller organisations, people have to do a little bit of everything. But there was a deliberate attempt to to specialise and to protect the organisation in that way. But I think it's very interesting evidence because, you know, if 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 we do see the Kinnahans back, um, this is obviously the the some of the some of the, the way the route is gonna go. And he said as well, Dave Gallagher, the senior leadership is now based in Dubai with other cells in mainland Europe and South America, while some cells remain in Ireland. So I mean I think that's interesting yeah, that that's right up to date. This is right up to date and you're talking um while we know 
of stuff in Ireland. We know Irish people, you know, we don't know who they have in, in South America, for example. No. But clearly... We know who they have in Spain, probably. Possibly, yeah. And and possibly other, but, but we, we don't even know if they have people in ports in, in around Europe. And yeah. we can only imagine that they do. Mm. Um, but those, you know, that... If if the day comes this year and there seems to be a growing expectation that it will, um, I think this is the sort of stuff that we're going to hear a lot more about. And so having heard that, the structure of it, um, Crotty sits at the bottom of this yeah. structure, surely. He has purchased some phone credit um, and that's why he's been charged in relation to this murder of Noel Kerwin. Yeah. So... I mean, in in he, while he was being cross examined, uh, Superintendent Gallagher agreed with Mr. Crawley's defence lawyer, who said that um, up until this investigation into the the murder of of Noel Duggan Kieran, Mr. Crotty was not on his radar and was not a name that had cropped up during his investigations into into organised crime. So that was agreed with by Superintendent uh, Gallagher. But um, Mr. Crahi has obviously denied all charges and it's, has gone to a full trial. Mm. Now, um, Superintendent Gallagher also said that the level of violence has fallen dramatically since 2018, but that the organisation still exists. He identifies um, the murder of Gary Hutch in Spain in 2015 as what he calls the kernel yeah. of the feud. And he said to the court, I could go back further in that if you want a history lesson, which I totally agree because, I mean, you have to identify the kernel of the feud somewhere, but you can go back a bit. You can yeah, go back, you can a go back to further. money disputes, you money know, disputes, five years back, back maybe. Back to the shooting of Jamie Moore in the garden of Daniel Kinnan's home. Yeah. Every time you, you kind of settle on a place, which is the beginning of the feud, you kind of can find another bit, yeah. can't you? But I suppose... What's significant there is, you know, at that time in 2015, there'd been a falling out with Gary Hutch and Daniel Kinahan. Um, they, that falling out had happened certainly a year before that and in, in, in around 2014. Before that, Gary Hutch and Daniel Kinahan were living um, in what was described as being like a married couple. Yeah, They were living together. They were eating together. They were best friends. They shared a villa in uh, Daniel's villa out in Spain. They used to, I was told that they would finish the day's work, whatever it was they were doing, and that they'd often both put on their pajamas <laughs> and sit in front of the telly like yeah. two old buddies. And, you know, they'd have their, whether they had a glass of wine or a cup of tea, I don't know, but that's what they did. And they were just like in this absolute, what do they call that? Codependent relationship. Well, no, well, that's a little <laughs> high brow. I was actually going to, you know when, oh yeah, bromance. A bromance, bromance, right, okay. They're having okay. a bromance, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and obviously all bromances can go to the wall, but theirs really did. Uh, so yes, he describes the, the, the murder of Hutch as the kernel of the feud. And he talks about the Kinahan organisation, obviously the Regency attack of 2016, which everybody knows. And that was followed by Mr. Kerwin's murder in December of 2016. Um, and he says at that point, the senior leadership was based in Malaga in Spain with some se senior figures based in Ireland. But within uh, months of the Kerwin murder in around 2017, you see that increased collaboration between the Irish and the Spanish authorities, which is what drove them out of Spain and uh, into the Gulf. Into the, the promised land of the Gulf where I think they thought they were going to be untouchable. But you see them describing, uh, you see Superintendent Gallagher also describing increased collaboration with officials in Dubai. Yeah. So look, it's, it's you know, this is the case. Um, if they ever do get brought home, there'll be a couple of hundred pages of a evidence book, if not more, mm. which we'll probably never get our hands on. Um, but I think this is the broader, you know, you can see what what the guards What's would agree. Together. Yeah, and how they believe the, the organisation uh, differed, in particular from the Hutch organisation, which mm. is described much more as a, a sort of a loose collaboration. And I think that was, that's very interesting in of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you see how mismatched uh, these groupings were mm. uh, 
to to you know during the feud and you can see obviously the 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 amount of people killed on the hutch side was so much greater but you can see the, the how mismatched they were uh, at the the point at which that feud uh, kicked off at, during following the murder of Gary Hutch really and of course two other people have been convicted in relation to the murder of Noel Kerwin um Mr Nobody yeah um Declan Brady has has pled guilty Mr. to nobody's name. Just yeah, flew out of my yeah. head there. Declan Brady has pleaded guilty to facilitating yeah. the the murder, and yeah, he didn't go for trial. No, and then um, Mark, Jason Jason Keating as well. Um, Jason Keating, thank you. And he he was he was involved in in the tracker the that, that was placed on 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 his car. Um, and we also, um, yeah. So he he was he probably has almost finished his sentence at this stage. Um, mm. So I mean, they're certainly picking up a lot of these. Uh, look, a lot of these cases now. You see them. It's the electronic surveillance and the ability to track uh, people's movements by phone. Um, it takes a good while, but they're coming to court. I mean, what is it? It's it's you know six seven years after after the fact or. Probably not that long, is no, it? No, you're right, Shesh. Yeah. Seven. Yeah, so you Seven. see you see the, the, and we're going to see that again um, through any trials that go on this year. Yeah. You know, digital surveillance has become a huge tool. I mean, there was an interesting case as well yesterday. Fat Freddy's appeal was turned down. I don't know if you you read that, um, but it was something that we have discussed as well. Um, they had harsh words, I suppose, for the defence that CCTV uh you know, you're breaching somebody's privacy by collecting CCTV for a, for a murder trial. I think they made very strong statements. Uh, the court, the judges in their in their judgment, which I think would limit um, that defence being put forward again. I thought it was it was kind of striking. They were saying mm. that it's just not going to work in an Irish court, and it's effectively wasting the court's time right. to continue to bring up. Um, that somebody's privacy is breached mm -hmm. if if a shop, for example, CCTV is taken from a shop and somebody walks by. It's part of his defence used in the original yeah, murder trial. Yeah, and and it, it featured in the appeal, and it yeah. was it wasn't just uh, dismissed. I think they sort of set down a marker to say that that you're not you cannot have a total expectation of privacy walking down the street, yeah. let alone if you're involved in a criminal con conspiracy. And I actually think that it might sort of. I don't think we'll we'll hear that in courts to the same extent again. As no. a result, I think that it'll, it'll be said that 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 isn't going to work. That yeah. you know that 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 it will sound silly now after after this. Yeah, when they have this, court. they have this precedent yeah. that if we that is put forward, Freddie Thompson for that. <laughs> we can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Everyone needs to be thanked about something. Yeah. Um, the Crotty trial will continue for another couple of weeks, and uh, you know I'm sure we're not the only ones watching it closely. And no, the evidence. No, I'm sure we're not. I'd say there's a few people in Dubai who are keeping a close eye on. Pressing refresh on their, their yeah, report news. Exactly. Right. Okay. We'll leave it at that. Thanks, Nicola. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs, and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.